All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. It is Tuesday, and you know what that means. Time for another video. Time for what used to be a continuation in the series of Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, Tuesday Dow, Do the Dow Now. However, that series was long ago, but we just keep doing videos on Tuesdays, and also Wednesdays, Wednesday Wisdom. Wisdom of the Ages, which turned into recently our research into hermetics, and the kitten wants to say hi, ladies and gentlemen. But today, we will be doing something new, and we will be diving into Mysteries of the Unexplained. I started uh, reading a little bit of this just a couple of days ago. And it's a book that's been sitting on my shelf for quite some time. And I got it from my grandfather when he passed away. And when we went out to Illinois to do the services and all that. And it was one of the things that I brought back. My grandfather always had a very interesting and inquisitive mind, like myself, interested in spirituality and the mysterious things of reality. And so I thought it would be nice to start a new series and dive into some of the mysteries of the unexplained. Because the little bit that I began with, which goes into beyond... The walls of time, ladies and gentlemen, into prophecies, anomalies, and some of the craziest coincidences that have ever been heard of, told, recorded. But I figure let's, real quick, out of tradition, head over to Dr. Wayne W. Dyer here, and let's do ourselves a little bit, one verse of the Tao Te Ching, since it is Tuesday, Tuesday Tao. Do the Tao now, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> the third verse, Dr. Wayne Dyer titles, Living Contentment. And so, let us do the third verse for today's Tuesday Tao. The third verse of the Tao Te Ching begins by saying, Putting a value on status will create contentiousness. If you overvalue possessions, People begin to steal. By not displaying what is desirable, you will cause the people's hearts to remain undisturbed. The sage governs by emptying minds and emptying hearts, by weakening ambitions and strengthening bones. Practice not doing. When action is pure and selfless, Everything settles into its own perfect place. Practice not doing, ladies and gentlemen. When action is pure and selfless, everything settles into its own perfect place. Now take this as an analogy or a metaphor for life. For me, example, doing these videos, if I'm trying to do something specific, like I used to in the past, like, oh, I have to follow this guideline and stick to this kind of script, or instead of just having a good time, I don't think the action would be pure and selfless. And I really don't think everything would settle into its own place, as I believe it has. And this goes to us trusting in the universe and God and the Tao and Atum, and allowing and not trying to force and to push things. And this leads to much greater peace, and happiness in life, which is what we're all about here and the purpose of this channel. No, no matter what we look into, regardless of the topics, whether it's just spirituality, whether it's mysticism, whether it's into the occult or the esoteric, or even just mysteries of the unexplained, the purpose here is to seek to achieve and maintain happiness through a greater awareness of all of these topics any topic, as Hermes Trismegistus puts it, simply to seek to know the things that are. And by hopefully increasing our awareness of ourselves, of our spirituality, of our psychology, and of all of these things, that we can hopefully increase the quality of our lives. Do the Tao now. Wayne Dyer will give us how we can use this wisdom in our life today. Watch for an opportunity today to notice that you're planning on buying something. 
Choose to do the Tao and listen for guidance. Be grateful that you have the choice to make the purchase. Then practice listening to yourself and not doing. This may be a great challenge for some of us. Through your feelings, the Tao will reveal the way for you in that moment. Trust it. You might be guided to buy the item and savor it with gratitude. Donate it, procure one for you and one for someone else. Give the money to charity instead of getting the item or refrain from obtaining it altogether. But the point here is practice listening to yourself and not doing. Practice doing the Tao in everyday situations and you will know contentment in a deeper sense. As this verse says, when action is pure and selfless, everything settles into its own perfect place. Now, that's a definition of contentment, Dr. Wayne Dyer says. Always love Dr. Wayne Dyer. There's our little bit of Tuesday Dow, ladies and gentlemen, now to begin an entirely new series. On the channel, we come to Mysteries of the Unexplained, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm very excited to share this with you. We will be doing this for purposes of teaching and commentary and expanding the mind so that we can continue to increase our awareness of the nature of the things that are of reality. And so this um, doesn't have a single author, as it comes from a very long time ago, 1982, ladies and gentlemen, copyright 1982, the Reader's Digest Association. Now, you might be thinking, now, what kind of, I mean, what are we really going to find with the Reader's Digest kind of stuff? Well, I'm interested in prophecies and beyond the walls of time. Anomalies. Monsters, spectral incursions, strange things from above, unidentified flying objects, ladies and gentlemen, atmospheric and astronomical oddities and anomalies, and then the realm of miracles, which is where I'm always fascinated with, with manifesting. I mean, that's kind of where it began. That's kind of where it began, interested in can we create a better life for ourselves through this secret knowledge that has seemingly been lost or kept hidden or for a select few? Well, the endless search for answers, ladies and gentlemen. And that is where we find ourselves, the endless search for answers. Beyond the Walls of Time will be the first chapter we delve into. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science, coming to us from Albert Einstein. Now, before I begin here, let me give a little credit to those involved in the creation of this, since this is the beginning of this series. Mysteries of the Unexplained, Project Editor Carol C. Calkins, Art Editor Vincent L. Perry, Associate Editors Noreen B. Church, Susan Brackett, Susan Parker, Research Editor Hildegard Anderson, Shirley Miller, George Pace, Tanya Strange, Strange, Copy Editors Sahava Feldman, Picture Editor Robert J. Woodward, Picture researcher Marianne Bodine, art editor Larissa Lorienko, and editorial assistant Dolores H. Dan. Many other more, while well, just the chief contributing writer, Richard Marshall, chief contributing or contributing writers, Monty Davis, Valerie Mulliman, and the researchers, of course, Amy Dolly, Helen M. Hinkle, Sarah Solenberg, and Jefeza Stewart. Now, once again, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. The book begins by saying, quote, and once again, thank you for being here and joining me, ladies and gentlemen. I love and appreciate each and every one of you. And hopefully we get value out of this. Like I always say, I'd just be reading this on my own, and I actually already was this week and wanted to share it with you. 
It begins by saying, quote, close in importance to the basic human needs for food, shelter, and companionship comes the urge to create an orderly world governed by dependable rules and develop a reassuring structure of beliefs. This urge, since the beginning of recorded time, has provided a receptive audience for seers, scholars, scientists, and experts of every persuasion. There has never been, nor is there likely to be, a shortage of authorities ready to find reasonable explanations for all observed phenomena and to provide solutions for the mysteries of the universe, the mysteries of reality, I would say. But I mean, this is a key thought process here, or insight, <clears throat> is that us as human beings are always seeking out these basic needs, these comforts, creature comforts as some call them, food, shelter, companionship, and, you know, whatever goes along with that, and this urge to create an orderly reality that we can, at a high predictability, feel comfort in knowing that there isn't a whole bunch of unknown going on because you know for most of us the scariest thing is the unknown is what you know the the sitting there not knowing what is possibly going to happen and so we begin to develop about these unknowns like we're researching on this channel the nature of god about whom the nature of reality and how our how we are connected to that wow so for many of those who are considered experts and as we know science nowadays is at least at the expert level is a bunch of garbage and people not willing to really open their minds now there could be an argument made for the other half of that and that's great the more that we can get for those that are willing to open their minds and see beyond the you know science the the rhetoric of academia that we're all stuck in, that for some reason they seem to want us to be stuck in, to not know that these things that they've been selling us aren't exactly the entire reality that we are beginning to discover. Alternatively, however, now let us continue. This urge to develop a reassuring structure of beliefs has led to an audience for seers. I mean, if we're just common people out here trying to understand the nature of reality and what's going on, and we have this urge to have a structured reality so we don't we're not constantly living in uncertainty, and we want to have that comfort, then obviously we seek out those who seem to be or may be experts in these areas. Seers, scholars, I would add mystics, philosophers, sages, oracles. But there has never been, nor is there likely to be, the book continues, a shortage of authorities ready to find explanations to explain away all of the craziest, I'll add, phenomena and try to provide solutions for these mysteries of reality. And yet there are events that seem to say that our rules and our beliefs and even our common sense may sometimes let us down. In the past, men and women believed that the world around them had a miraculous dimension. And I think even more and more today, this is coming back to us, or it was never really lost. It was just explained away to us. No, that's not real. You know, I mean, you can't actually, anyway, sorry, once again. We believed that the world around us had a miraculous dimension, that angels and demons were real, that prayers were efficacious. Now, those are weird examples. I would say, what about, you know, spirits and gods and all of the mystical and magical things 
fairies, possibly, but druids and, you know, the people that had the lost wisdom of the ages. The man, that this idea that we all were in a very special place in the universe and we all have a very special place in the universe. And this has been lost to so many of us, and I would invite all of us to invite this back in to our reality. That all the things that we've been told that aren't real, all the magical fairy tales and dragons and the like, is much more possibly real than we ever have considered for ourselves. Now, let me continue. Today, fewer and fewer people believe in such a world, for many existence has become something divine, defined, sorry. That would be great if existence had become something rather divine for everybody. <laughs> but I think we have a long way to go on working towards that goal, ladies and gentlemen. So, existence for most people, and this is how reality becomes boring and, you know, terrible, and not very wonderful and enjoyable. So we're seeking to return to that joy and that wonderment of reality and to offer that to those around us in our lives. And hopefully we can all begin to enjoy life a bit more, ladies and gentlemen, because that's the, really the only purpose we're here once again. Like you, you, can, you either enjoy your life or you don't, and life is made up of moments. So how, what are we going to do in order to increase the quality of our moments we're going to try to use a greater understanding and a knowledge and a wisdom that has been left to us throughout time by the greatest minds and times of our history now. But for most people, life has become boring. Existence has become defined by politics, economics, and discoveries made in laboratories. And yet an instinct... For the unknown persists within each and every one of us, and I know it's within you, ladies and gentlemen. If it wasn't, you probably wouldn't be watching this channel at all, or any other channels related around any of these topics. Mysticism, spirituality, philosophy, and a search for the wisdom of the ages, and the lost wisdom. Yet this instinct for the unknown persists, and the conviction also that not everything in our lives can be cut and dried by the statisticians. The statistics, ladies and gentlemen, controlled in the halls of government or defined in a test tube. For though more has been learned about the Earth and the cosmos in the past 25 years, remember this was back in 1982, and now we have a different perspective on reality. However, that in all the preceding years of recorded history, <laughs> that's pretty arrogant to say. We know that's not the truth. However, the more we have probed, the more mysterious the world has become. Now, that's truer than ever, always throughout time. The more that we learn, the more that we, we research, the more that we come to know, the more that we know that we don't know shit. <laughs> Pardon Pardon that there, but I mean, that's just the saying, and it's wonderful. The more that you find that you know, the more that you find that you know you don't know anything. Ladies and gentlemen, the more answers you get, the more questions you have. And remember to question answers, and ask questions, and then question the answers again. This leads to a greater understanding. As Hermes Trismegistus taught us, thrice greatest Hermes, or the Egyptian sage god Thoth, to Hot said that pure philosophy comes through a constant, constant, constant contemplation. Pardon me there. A rumination, a ponderation, a meditation, a thinking upon, and a continued constant contemplation to attain true knowledge of what he called Atum, the one God, but simply put, reality, or the things that are. And so through this constant contemplation, we can hopefully get to where we're trying to go. However, remember the allowing from our verse of the Tao Te Ching today. Practice not doing, not forcing. When it is, when it is pure and selfless, 
It is when you are not forcing it and you are letting it happen. The more that we have looked into the world, the more mysterious the world has become. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> she wants to sit on my lap today. And so, in view of the strangeness persistently revealed around us, the more that we learn, common sense does not require us to accept the uncommon. However, should we not abandon our conventional notions of the laws of nature? Of course we should, just for a short time, and then we can come back. I mean, there's also a great saying that says, when you consider two opposite possibilities at the same time, you can actually reach a greater understanding, rather than being stuck in one side, the dogma, or the other side. As our scientists tune in to the reverberations of cosmic creation, must we adhere to the idea that time progresses in a linear way? Or is it cyclical, as we have been taught by the Yuga cycles and the, you know, the Mayan calendars and all of these great calendars from the great wisdom of the ages, from centuries and centuries and thousands of years ago, that we obviously had a greater understanding of the nature of reality, and we have come down in the yuga cycle since then, and we are slowly beginning to remember or awaken to the knowledge that we forgot from the previous golden age to where we are now. And we've looked at the yuga cycles before on this channel. If you want to check out that, do a quick Google search and pull up the yuga cycles. And you can see the great year and how we go from the golden age to the silver, to the bronze, to the dark age, noting that each is longer and decreases in time till you get to the dark age, which is a very short time, which is wonderful for us. Thank goodness it's not the other way around. However, let us continue. Must we adhere to the idea that time progresses in a linear way, or can we look at this cyclical nature of the repeating qualities, whether it be the greatest times or even the cosmic catastrophes and the cataclysms that leave us left with so many of the confusing things and maybe even our amnesia to remember them. But once again, we will awaken again to the lost knowledge of ourselves, of our ancestors. I like the, the way that whoever wrote this says the editors here, so whoever I mentioned in the beginning, but they have a real good, I like the wording. It's, it's 1980s feel, you know? Hopefully you're getting value, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, thank you for being here. So, cannot past, present, and future exist simultaneously? Now really ponder on this, because this is a thing that somebody asked me when I was talking about past lives and reincarnation. And he brought up, well, time, he was like, if time isn't linear and all of time is actually happening spontaneously, so like the past and the future and now are all just part of one continuum from a nonlinear perspective. And remember, we got into the linear and the nonlinear and the wisdom of Dr. David R. Hawkins um, also, like, maybe a month or so ago on Tuesdays. But there's a series on the channel playlist. Go over to Playlist and The Wisdom of Dr. David R. Hawkins. Now, past, present, future exists simultaneously. So if we have past lives, and we can not only maybe do regressions and discover wisdom from our past lives that can possibly help us, in our current life, and if this is a simultaneous thing, then is it also possible that future lives are also already happening? Now, this is very deep. That's what that made me think of. Can not past, present, and future exist simultaneously? Must every effect be preceded by a cause? 
cannot psychic energy make itself manifest in physically observable ways? Manifesting? It is questions like these that open the doorway to the vast and intriguing world of the unknown. And it is people like us, ladies and gentlemen here, that tend to ask these questions to ourselves maybe more often than those that seem to be stuck in the quote unquote rat race or the survival instinctual ego, you know, subconscious programming that is our animalistic instinctual nature to try to do all the things that we are told to do from the tribe, quote unquote, to survive so that we fit in and our world seems to be caught in this cycle of trying to make money and trying to collect things and gain status and all of that. And really, there's many more questions that we can ask of the nature of reality, of the nature of God and of our spirituality and how we are connected and how that is connected to all of us. The editors of the Reader's Digest, continuing from what the book says, recognize the fascination of such questions, and I thank them for doing so. In Mysteries of the Unexplained, our new series, we have gathered hundreds of reports suggesting that the miraculous, the mysterious, and the enigmatic are alive and well, and always have been. And still are, ladies and gentlemen. This comes to us from the 80s once again. But we must also recognize and warn against the danger of exaggeration. And this is even true for us today in the alternative communities, looking into alternative possible realities, is be very careful. For it can be very easy, and this is often me, I love the exaggerative and the, the, you know, my mind's so open. Sometimes it might almost fall out on the sidewalk. However, <laughs> that's why I don't really like to tell you, I know I'm open to anything. Is the world flat? I don't know. Give me some reasons why it might be. That's interesting. Is it round? All right. Well, I've been told that my whole life, but I'm open to anything. Is it a rhombus? Is it a toroid? That's what I think the most interesting because then that leads to the possibility of the ice sheets and the inner earth and you know a lot of that stuff but even that's just possibilities i mean is there a nice wall and is there extra terra beyond this wall and you know all of these different theories or is it literally just as simple as we've been told and reality isn't that exciting at all i don't know it's all a possibility and if we can consider all these possibilities, we can begin to hopefully discover the true nature of all of these things. But be careful against the danger of exaggeration, against the danger of biases, being biased to one side or another. You can find that very easily when somebody is not very open to an alternative possibility, like these flat earthers out there that are like, no. I have all the proof here. There's zero reason and other explanation for anything except that it's a plane and there's all of this. You know, they have like a whole explanation for it. And I'm like, right when you think that you know everything is when you should begin realizing that you're probably not, you know, getting it all. It's like right when you think you know everything, you know nothing. And when you know nothing, then you know. This is also a teaching from the Tao Te Ching. However, I think it actually goes, those who speak know not, and those who do not speak know. So if I did know everything, and if any of us did know everything, then we might not even say anything at all. And I think that's a John Levi quote, or a John Levy. So shout out to John Levy channel. Very fascinating, once again, for the open-minded. But do not be swayed by exaggeration, bias, and distortion in the reporting of inexplicable happenings and things in reality. 
This book is an almanac of events that defy explanation in commonly accepted terms. Some of the events are chilling. Some document seeming miracles. Many suggest that the human mind and body have, it says, uncanny capabilities. But as I seem to paraphrase so often, which is what I've been doing this whole time, a little bit, seem to human minds seem to have super human abilities, as we've found more recently than the 80s. While others suggest that creatures unknown to science and staggering to the imagination are roaming the world, Bigfoot, maybe, the Sasquatch, ladies and gentlemen, it's so funny when some of those come out and, you know, <laughs> people get so excited and you're like, is it a guy in a suit on the side of the hill? Or is it really just a, you know, a Bigfoot ready to pose? I don't know. But even pictures in the 1800s look like we're all just posing for the camera. So why would... Why would Bigfoot be any different, ladies and gentlemen? I don't know. I don't know. But then there's people that believe that these creatures are interdimensional and they can come in and out of physical reality as they wish. Or they only appear as apparitions to us for some reason or another. Once again, these are all mysteries of the unexplained and some would like to claim that they know the entirety and truth of all cryptology. The research of cryptids. However, many suggest that the human mind and body have uncanny capabilities, while others suggest that the creatures unknown to science are roaming the world. Some reports propose that the cosmos may not be so sterile or uneventful as we think, and we've learned a whole lot in that category since 1982, ladies and gentlemen. Now it's like, oh yeah, UFOs, that's the old you know, now it's just observable phenomenon for everybody and reported on publicly on the news by our government, by our system. I don't know. It's just it's getting to an interesting point. Ladies and gentlemen, there are those that think we may see a fake alien invasion with all we can do with projection you know, holograms, holographic imagery, um, things in that nature, deep fakes of a different sense. But it's like, if we began being invaded by aliens, the question comes now, how would we really know that it's even actually happening? I mean, who's to say that it wouldn't be us invading ourselves in, a, in, a, in an attempt to disguise ourselves as aliens. But that makes me think of the great quote, that whatever this is that we've been dealing with, that's been causing the struggles of our reality and going against humanity, that whatever this is may be disguising itself. It may be so alarming and so scary that it has disguised itself as an alien invasion and so not to alarm us. I didn't nail that quote exactly, but you get what I'm saying. It's so inconceivable. Inconceivable. I don't think that word means what you think it means. In the famous words of Inigo Montoya. A shout out to the Princess Bride, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and Miracle Max. Remember, he's not... Fully dead. He's only mostly dead. There's a big difference. Big difference, ladies and gentlemen. Now, see, we're getting off topic and I'm rambling. Once again, thank you for being here. And if you've been here before, you know this is what we usually do. We're just here to have fun and think about some of these wild subjects and things. Now, <clears throat> Some reports propose the cosmo cosmos, okay, turn about extraterrestrials or ourselves from the future coming back. It's like a breakaway civilization that escaped 
the previous cataclysm or reset or whatever you want to call it. And now it's coming back, trying to, I don't know, communicate in some way, help us along the path. Others, incredible stories of coincidence hint that sometimes the inorganic world conspires with life to create bizarre or meaningful patterns in the vast tracts of time and space. In short, the stories gathered here imply that what we see and know of the everyday world represents only a small glimpse and glimmer of how things really are. How things really are. And like when I was reading this the other day, I'm like, man, this is my kind of thought here. I mean, this is why I've been doing this channel, researching into everything. I mean, I got books on the old world, on earthing, the art of war from Sun Tzu, uh, Sun Tzu, sorry, the Bhagavad Gita. I can never say that one right. The Bhagavad, <laughs> Bhagavad Gita. There we go. I got it. The Bhagavad Gita. Greater Initiates, Lost Cities, the Kabbalion. I mean, there's so much in this reality. Zen, becoming supernatural, becoming spiritual healers. There is just so much in reality. There's spiritual solutions to every problem. But, ladies and gentlemen, Our researchers, they said, where have we found these stories that we'll be reading in this series in Mysteries of the Unexplained for purposes of teaching and commentary, expanding the mind once again? Well, they say our researchers have sought far and wide in the 1980s, probably even the 70s, to track down recorded accounts of the strange and remar remarkable in newspapers from around the world and from journals of learned societies in meteorological reports, and the logs of ships' captains. Wow. Admiral Byrd? I mean, when you go, because a lot of times nowadays, the strangest things will come out in, like, a local newspaper. Does it ever make it to any larger media outlet? No. And is it removed from public viewability? very quickly when it is something that we are not supposed to see, quote unquote, I would say yes. And so we must diligently find and share these things as soon as they are available before they are hidden from us. I think back in the 70s and the 80s, they weren't instantly covering up things that they didn't want us to know about as much as they have been since, I don't know, 91? That's when my life started. Since 99? Easily since the beginning of the 2000s and 2001. However, in newspapers from around the world, travelers, diaries, ancient chronicles, police records and the records of archaeological excavations, and in the testimony of even, like ourselves, ordinary men and women who have related what they themselves have seen or experienced. And how we can judge these reports. How can we judge these reports? Well, we can establish that all the events related herein occurred exactly as they have been recounted. Human beings are fallible, of course. Excitable and prone to exaggeration. So that's why I warned us earlier in all of our research, in all of reality, not just the mysteries of the unexplained, but literally the knowledge of the things that are, that we must be careful to exaggeration, the danger of bias and distortion in the reporting of inexplicable happenings. So, but we can, they say, document every report. Someone at some specific time or place wrote down an account of each phenomenon described. All these sources are given in this book, and so our criteria should be the same as those applied to more conventional testimony 
by the jury in a court of law. Like the jury, it is up to us to measure the credibility of the witnesses who speak to us in these reports, and we will do so together as we go through these. We may doubt or disbelieve, and I'd love to hear what you think in the comments below. This should be a fun one. But when we find numerous witnesses to a certain class of phenomena, we may also suppose, if we choose, that not all those witnesses are lying. This is what I like to call synchronicities, correlations. There's many other ways to say that. But, however, we may also suppose, if we choose, that not all those witnesses are lying, but there may be shortcomings in our common sense notions of what is and what is not possible. As we read on in the future and in future episodes in this exciting series of mysteries of the unexplained, we may agree that many things still remain hidden from us, as always is the case, ladies and gentlemen. As a philosopher, Seneca, S-E-N-E-C-A, Seneca, Seneca, observed in the first century, Leave me a comment. Let me know who that is. You're always helpful about that, my wonderful viewers. So thank you. The philosopher Seneca observed in the first century, our universe, quote, is a sorry little affair unless it has something, unless it has in it something for every age to investigate. Nature does not reveal her mysteries once and for all. Nature does not reveal her mysteries. God, the Tao, Atum, Grand Organized Design, G-O-D, whatever you want to call it. The mysteries of reality are not revealed all at once and to everybody at the same time. It is for those who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the mind to contemplate. And when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And oftentimes the teacher is not a person at all, but just something you see in the distance or the leaves in the tree. It's just like the right time you'd be thinking something and it's like, wow, personal revelation, Satori, instant enlightenment, a new personal awareness. Beyond the walls of time, ladies and gentlemen. And this will be the first chapter and focus that we'll be going into. The Sibyl, the prophetess of Delphi, looks into the future. I'll give you an image of that. The prophetess, the prophetess of Delphi. Now, the present is our only point of reference for the past and for the future, and our awareness of any happening must obviously occur somewhat after the actual event itself. So what then are we to make of the time warp that allows some people to prophesy and to make prophecies, that which will happen in the future? Anomalies and coincidences are related phenomena, and that they are both departures from the expected time frame, that some prophecies do come true, and that anomalies of many kinds exist, and that coincidences abound. All this is without question. The, quote-unquote, as yet, fathomless mystery is what force or forces are powerful enough to bring them into being. To bring them into being, ladies and gentlemen. And it begins on a description of prophecies and the difference between precognition, prediction, prophecies, and even premonitions. And that's very fascinating. And that is where we will begin next week ladies and gentlemen and then it, then it begins into biblical prophecies fulfilled as we know our standing on 
such scripted prophecies. But it gets to that in here, which is beautiful. Maybe I'll give you a bit of that right here. When it comes to scripted prophecy, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. a certain group disagreed with the theological significance attached to these verses by Christians, while others disparaged their worth as prophecies on the grounds that they were self-fulfilled. So if you've ever heard somebody say scripted prophecy, here is an example of that. They were self-fulfilled on the grounds, that is, that a unique character and his followers could have fulfilled these prophecies quite deliberately and engineered the events of the New Testament or their account of them based on their knowledge of and a plan to conform to the outline in the Old Testament. If that doesn't blow your mind, then wow. That blew my mind immediately, and I was like, wow, I've never heard it put that way. Since the group that was older than the Christians didn't have the same, you know, the same breakaway spiritual philosophy, if you want to you know, put it that way. It's all Judeo-Christian in some sense. However, there's these little differences. And the fact that the prophecies that were prophesied in the New in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New Testament could have been on purpose, self-fulfilled on the grounds that the character and his followers fulfilled them quite deliberately and engineered the events of the New Testament or their account of them to conform to a plan outlined in the Old Testament. While this view, assuming the factual veracity of the Gospels, may or may not detract from Christ's status. See, I like that they put that there. So even if they did purposely fulfill them, maybe this is just the roman story we got from this after the um the council of nicaea you know created a created a what do you call it when they got rid of all of it and created a canon they created a dogma they created a canon that you are to follow that other things are not included and this is all that there is I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I hope you get what I'm getting at here. But even assuming if this character is just fictional to fulfill the scripted prophecy, or if it's totally opposite and it was all legitimate and it all was prophesied, this doesn't detract from the teachings of great spiritual teachers. So whether or not they really even existed, it's the lessons in the teachings that are more important. And so it does not have any logical bearing on the prophetic connection between Old and New Testament events. And we will get more into that next week as well as a contest of oracles in the story of how the Oracle of Delphi, a priestess traditionally known as the Pythoness, became to be so famous as we know her so well, exercises her magical powers, having put herself under a spell by inhaling fumes and chewing laurel leaves. And then we have an entire page here on synchronicity. There's the oracle at Delphi. On synchronicity, ladies and gentlemen. Should we... Do that today or leave it for next time? No, I think we'll leave it for next time. I do want to find, though, there was this amazing story. So we're going to go over Nostradamus, Swedenborg's vision, truth follows fiction, the priest of Bell, Mark Twain's dream. Very interesting. Dang. Even into Babylonian 
tablets, the two fragments which you have published separately on pages 22 and 26 being all together, they are not finger rings. Their history is as follows. King Kurig Alzu, 1300 BC, once sent to the temple of Bel, among other articles of agate and lapis lazuli, an inscribed votive cylinder of agate. The gate? I never know how to say that. <clears throat> the chief center for the worship of the god Bell, king of heaven and earth, and I hope that's not Baal. If that is, then terrible. But I think this is different. Was the center of Nippur, Nippur, in ancient Babylonia. In 1892, a priestly phantom took Dr. Herman Hilpricht back through the time, back through time, to the temple there and helped him to solve an archaeological mystery. Wow. See, that's another story that we will get into. I've heard a story like that before where someone was in Egypt. That was Scotty Roberts. And one of his acquaintances that was there with him had quite a spiritual experience that gave them an insight into the understanding of the beautiful Egyptian tombs that they were visiting. Flight into the future, a preview of an air raid. Now this, I think, is the one that we will leave us with today, ladies and gentlemen. Just to give us an example of some of the interesting different stories that we will be able to question and ask ourselves, is this possible? Two newspapermen, ladies and gentlemen, claimed they witnessed an air raid that devastated Hamburg shipyards 11 years before it happened. This 1945 photograph shows the damage that they saw. Now, of course, just a black and white of some damage of the bombings of World War II. I think they were destroying beautiful architecture. But that's a different subject, ladies and gentlemen. So let us read this very fascinating, interesting story from J. Bernard Hutton on the other side of reality. In 1932, two German newspapermen, reporter J. Bernard Hutton, and photographer Josem Brandt were sent to do a story on the Haberg, Hamburg, sorry, Altona shipyards. Now, 1932. World War I was still being waged in September 1918. The War of 1938 was later, leading to World War II ladies and gentlemen, in the 40s. So in 1932, was in between. And actually, it was a time of relative peace. I mean, relative being the key word there. So keep that in mind. These two German newspapermen were sent to do a story on some shipyards that were totally fully intact. An executive showed them around the place, and by the end of the afternoon, their assignment was finished. I mean, very simple. An ordinary day, they did their story on the shipyards and were getting ready to head home. And then the mysterious and strange happens. Just as they left the yards, the two men heard the drone of aircraft overhead. And in short, while the noise of anti-aircraft guns drowned out all other sounds... Darkness had fallen, and soon the two men saw bombs exploding all around them. Now, you can imagine the scenery. We've all seen, you know, the bombing videos or recreations and films and whatever it be, shows. And the bombs exploding all around them, them taking shelter. Before long, the place was an inferno, and what they had first taken for a practice drill 
was all too clearly a full-scale air raid. They turned back and asked the guard at the gate if they could do anything to help. They were threateningly told to go about their business. Now that's weird as well. And so the two, two newspaper men drove back to Hamburg. Although the sky had been dark throughout the attack and they were surprised to find Hamburg going about its everyday business like nothing happened. By the light of an ordinary late afternoon, they stopped their car and looked back towards the shipyards. They too lay intact and unharmed in the fading daylight. When Brandt's photographs were developed, he had kept on shooting throughout the air raid and they showed nothing unusual. And when the editor heard their story, he accused them of being drunk on the job. Just before World War II broke out, Hutton left to Germany to live in England. What a strange coincidence. There, in 1943, he saw a newspaper account of a highly successful night raid by the RAF, the Royal Air Force, on the Hamburg shipyards. He saw more details of the attack and confirmed that what he had guessed, the scene of destruction, that he and his friend had witnessed that day in the spring of 1932 had been real after all, but only that they had seen it 11 years before it ever happened. Before it ever happened. And that is where our story ends there. But it leaves you with the question, ladies and gentlemen, is it possible that we can slip through time and space to a point in the future and witness an event yet to happen, but then step out of it as though nothing happened at all? Or in the contrary, is it possible that we can slip into the past and experience remnants of past times, and as we asked earlier, is it not possible that the future, the present, and the past all exist and are happening simultaneously? This, I think, is a wonderful story to excite our imagination into the mysterious and the mysteries of the unexplained, ladies and gentlemen. I would end it there because that was a perfect ending, but I just want to elaborate a little bit more on what happened here. These guys were in Germany doing a job and they totally witnessed an air raid and a bombing 11 years before it actually happens in reality, but they totally experienced it fully. But then as they were gone, it like it hadn't happened. And then even weirder, one of them moves to England from Germany at the most, you know, opportune time in reality to get out of anyways. And then they had seen it. The destruction that he had witnessed in the spring of 1932 had been real after all. And they had seen it 11 years before it happened. Is this prophecy? Is this a glimpse into the future? Well, I'll leave that up to your interpretation, ladies and gentlemen. Or were they simply just drunk on the job? I like to have the more exciting explanation because experts would so often say, no, that's impossible. Can't happen. These guys were hallucinating. And then they are making correlations. I forget what it's called when the human mind like makes connections to things and makes pattern out of things that aren't actually related at all. Just like you can look at the clouds and see a face. 
or, you know, these kind of things. But is this the case or did these men actually witness the bombing and the air raid on the Hamburg shipyards 11 years before it ever happened in reality? And had they slipped through time and space? Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be an exciting series. A date with destiny. Cognition of the future. Abducting the future. Very, very fascinating, ladies and gentlemen. I'll leave it there for today because that was a very fun beginning and introduction to the mysteries of the unexplained once again, reading for purposes of teaching and commentary. I say that because there is a fair use copyright law that says you can use things that are copyrighted for fair use on the grounds of purposes of teaching and commentary and also entertainment. And that's what all of this is. And expanding the mind, I add, so that we, and continue, remember, ladies and gentlemen, continue to seek to discover the lost wisdom of the ages, the hidden mysteries of our history, and the knowledge of the things that are. And also remember that there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. All the things that we've been telling ourselves, oh, when I get this and have that much, when we can begin to bring happiness to life, all of that becomes irrelevant, and then hopefully the entire journey is wonderful. The entire journey is wonderful. I, I threw myself off there. Purposes of teaching and commentary, expanding the mind so that we can increase our awareness of the nature of reality and ourselves and our spirituality and all the mysterious things in the nature of reality. So that through this increased awareness, we can increase the quality of our reality. Seek to achieve and maintain happiness through enlightenment, through greater awareness of all of it. All of it, I've said it five times right now, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. I love and appreciate each and every one of you that joins me here on these shows. I skipped last week, so if you're wondering if you missed anything, nope. I took a week off, and I'm not going to beat myself up about it. Not going to beat myself up about it. I also met uh, Sky Bridges, S-K-Y-H-I Bridges. Um, it's weird to actually meet somebody that has seen your YouTube channel in real life. They're like, hey, are you Chase? Do you do a YouTube channel? I'm like, yeah, what makes you say that? Because I have multiple channels, so I don't know which one they'd be. But yeah, I mean, he even asked me this week. He was like, what is your specialty into the occult? And I was like, oh, no, you know, I'm not. I'm just a dabbler, as I said. What I really meant is I don't know a damn thing, really. I'm just a researcher. I'm just somebody who's open-minded looking into this stuff. I don't know any, you know, I'm not like a magical practitioner or some kind. It seems like he was very interested in the tarot and has built his own deck. That's very, very cool. Using um, original, oh, I forget, was it Aramaic or... But one of the original languages to where a lot of our mystical knowledge comes from in what I like to call the wisdom of the ages or the, you know, the wisdom of thousands of years ago that has been passed down through us throughout time. But very cool. I've only had a couple readings. So anyway, I want to say a shout out to him. Always good to meet somebody and, you know, who is like minded and open minded, like. We all should be seeking to know the things that are. Quote once again from Hermes. All right. Appreciate you, ladies and gentlemen. I love you. And I send all the best of thoughts. Hope everybody's doing well. And once again, thank you for being here and joining me. And I will see you tomorrow on Wednesday Wisdom as we continue our series in the Corpus Hermeticum, the Divine Pymander. And we are on. Chapter 15 of Truth to His Son Taught. Very interesting. I look forward to that. All right. Love you, ladies and gentlemen. 
Be sure to uh, like, smash the like button, subscribe, share this with somebody who is like-minded. It helps support the work that we do here. This kind of work isn't the kind of stuff that the algorithms promote too much. So every little bit of help goes a long way, ladies and gentlemen. And also be sure to expand the description. I just got myself some C60 Purple Power, ladies and gentlemen, C60 Power now, as you can see there, shopc60.com. What is carbon 60? Carbon 60 is considered by scientists to be the most powerful antioxidant ever discovered. The Nobel Prize winning free radical sponge has the antioxidant efficacy of several hundred fold higher than conventional antioxidant, antioxidants sorry, like vitamin C. C60 does one thing really well. It fights oxidative stress at the cellular level by neutralizing free radicals more effectively than any other antioxidant known. By lifting the oxidative burden the cells are under, C60 supports the entire body. Here's my bottle of C60. Now, a long time ago, I tried to become an affiliate with them, but I didn't really have any, you know, I'm like, I'm not going to get even one person to click the link. But still, it's worth it because I like to share things that I support and that I use with people to give yourself and ourselves the gift of health, ladies and gentlemen. So we have our little two ounce, I think this is only about 50 bucks. It lasts me a long, you know, three months or more. So it's easily worth it for the health supplement. And it also gives me my dose. If you've heard anything from Dr. Gundry about olive oils and how much we should all be getting good doses of olive oils, no matter how we can every day in our lives, we can also amplify energy vigor. Anyways, this is sounding like a commercial. I just wanted to show you that I actually do use this and I haven't had some for a long time. If you're like low on energy and stuff, ladies and gentlemen, mm, this is the stuff. So you take a little, little dripper. And... Mm -hmm. I used to not be a big fan of olive oil, but I've been using it a lot over the last couple of years because of how healthy it is for you as compared to canola and other oils. Mm. And that is some C60. So give yourself the gift of health as well. Link to the book. Wait, no, not this one. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to find a link to this book on Amazon today. So I can put an affiliate link down in the description below if you want to get this book for yourself to put it on your shelf. If it's even available. I don't know. It was made in the 80s. It's got to be, though. So you can follow along in the future and for reference. Woo! olive oil all right i'll leave it there ladies and gentlemen love and appreciate each and every one of you thank you for spending time with here it means time with me here it means the world to me and so be the change you want to see be the example you want to set no 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 no